Good morning, boys and girls. Thank you for greeting me. Can I have the rest of you say that? How are you? Good morning. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, guys, do you know what's happening on Kent Street this afternoon? You're in the parade. Awesome. Right. There's a parade happening. Did you know that? You did. You didn't know that? Okay, now you do. Now you can tell Grandma you want to go to the parade. <laughs> Stand in the cold. <laughs> You're welcome. No, so it's called, what, do you know what this parade's called? It's the Santa's Parade, Santa Claus Parade. Right, exactly. And you know, that got me thinking about that song. Do you know what song it reminded me of? Christmas, what song? Santa... Exactly, that's the song it reminded me of. Santa Claus is coming to town. How many of you know that song? Do you? All right, you know what? We're going to sing it right now. Can we do that? All right, let's sing it. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pow. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows you when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pal, I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Awesome! I bet that's the first time ever in the history of St. Andrew's Lindsay we sang Santa Claus is coming to town in church. That is awesome. It's a little bit early, I know. Uh, it's a little bit early, but Santa Claus Parade is happening. And you know, when I was singing this song, I thought, wait a minute. It says, you better watch out and you better not cry. You better not pow. I'm telling you why. And then it says, he's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's... Exactly. So Santa's making a list. What kind of list is this? Naughty or nice list. Now here's a question for you. Where would Reverend Linda's name be on? Maybe in between. Maybe in between. <laughs> You're going to be a politician one day. <laughs> yes. Nice. You would hope my name would be on the list for nice. But you know, I have a feeling I'm probably on the naughty list. And you know what? The Bible actually tells us that we are all on the naughty list. How many of you think you're, you should be on the good list? How many of you think you should be on the naughty list? Okay, awesome. Well, let me tell you, in Romans 3.23, and I'm going to get someone to read that for me. Grace, can you read that for me? Uh, Romans 3.23, can you read verse 23 down there somewhere? And read it out loud so we can hear. Right here? Yeah. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely, but his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Okay, that's good. Great. It says, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you know, that's why we have Christmas. I'm going to get five volunteers. Can I get one, two, three, four, five? Can you come up? And I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a puzzle. Come on around. And I'm going to give you each a letter. And I want you guys to talk to one another. Here's a letter for you. Here's a letter for you. A letter for you. And I want you guys to try and scramble these letters. And tell me what word it is. Can you guys get yourself arranged so you can... And I'm going to tell you, why do we celebrate Christmas? What do we celebrate at Christmas? Do you know? Uh-huh. Faith? Uh, faith? What do we celebrate at Christmas? Why are we so excited at Christmas? Presents. Presents. <laughs> awesome. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Presents. What else? Whose birthday is it at Christmas? Uh-huh. God's. God's birthday. God's son's birthday. That's right. It's his birthday. And because Jesus came, although we're on the naughty list, 
we all are on the good list because Jesus came. That's why we celebrate. All right, can you stand? Uh, each of you give a, a, hold a letter and stand up and look out here. Range yourselves. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> that don't look like grace. Is that what that word's supposed to be? Okay, so you need to be on this side. Oh, and you need to switch. And there you go. Okay, folks, what does that spell? Grace. Grace, that's right. This is what Christmas is all about. Jesus came and gave himself as a gift to us, and that is the grace of God. Grace is a difficult word to understand, but we have someone here named Grace, right? That's right. It's a beautiful word, grace. It's God's grace that brought Jesus Christ to us. All right, folks, you can sit down. Thank you very much. And let's pray, and you guys can go downstairs to your Sunday school. As Kathy says, let's talk to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, that we get to celebrate Christmas. And that is that Jesus Christ was born in a manger for us. We thank you. He left the glories of heaven to come to earth to meet with us. And we pray, Father, that as we come closer and closer to Christmas, as we celebrate Christmas, that we will remember he is the reason for the season. Bless every one of these children, Lord, and the homes they represent. And I pray that as they go downstairs to their Sunday school, that you would bless their teachers and leaders, that it would be a wonderful time of continuing to learn more about your love. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture lesson is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, starting at verse 19 to verse 34. As I said earlier at the beginning during announcement, we're going to take a little break from our Genesis series and do a, a sermon today and next week on stewardship, focusing particularly on stewardship. So our lesson this morning is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 6, starting at verse 19 to verse 34. Let us hear the word of God. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is a lamp of the body. If the eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Here ends the reading of God's precious word. I was uh, browsing through the webpage on table etiquette. 
Ever heard of that? Yeah, it still exists, right. And I learned a few things. Do you know what are the top three subjects to avoid at dinner table? What do you think those top three subjects are? Politics, Politics religion, religion sex. sex. That's what I thought too. <laughs> But exactly, that's changed. That may have been 20 years ago, but it's changed. You can talk about sex now, apparently. <laughs> number one thing you're not to talk about is religion. And number two is finance. Number three, this is interesting, illnesses. Number four, and this surprised me, age, weight, height, and shoe size. <laughs> shoe size, really? <laughs> Well, friends, this morning we're going to talk about the two top subjects we're to avoid, and that is religion and finance. To put it more bluntly, faith and money. People come and tell me that some people think that the church always talks about money. And I find that surprising. Most churches like ours designate a Sunday or two on stewardship to force ministers to teach and preach about money. Why do we need to be forced to preach about money? Because frankly, most ministers feel very uncomfortable. It's dangerous to preach about money. There's a story about Mr. Bill Jones, who was recovering from a heart attack. One day, his wife, Edith, an answered the phone and learned that they had just won the $5 million Reader's Digest sweepstake. Bill and Edith should be expecting confirmation the next day by Federal Express letter, and a courier would arrive the day after with the check. Of course, Edith was overjoyed. With $5 million, they could really retire. They could travel. Life would be wonderful. But then Edith had a second thought. After all, Bill just had a, is, was recovering from a heart attack. Even though the news was good, the shock might kill him. She could just, she just imagined him clutching his chest and falling to the floor and die. So Edith called the minister for advice. The minister agreed to think about ways to gently break the news to Bill. When the minister arrived at Bill and Edith's place, he asked Bill, Bill, if, if, if Bill could help him with a problem, the minister said, Bill, one of the people in the congregation just won $5 million, and he's asking me for advice on what to do with it. What would you do if you won $5 million? That's easy, Bill said. I'd give half of it to the church. The minister clutched his chest, <laughs> fell to the floor, and died. <laughs> I want you to know I have a very strong heart, so <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Money is a sensitive subject, and there are some people who say the church ought to stick to spiritual things and stay away about the talk of money. And yet, do you know what Jesus talked about the most? 16 of Jesus' 38 parables or teachings deal with how to handle money and possessions. 16 out of 38, that's almost half of the parables. In the whole of the Bible, there are approximately 500 verses on the subject of prayer. Another 500 approximately verses on the subject of faith. But there are approximately 2,000 on the subject of money and possessions. The Bible deals with matters of money because money matters. And Jesus tells us right here in our reading, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Money and possessions matter because it is a matter of our hearts. First, our scripture lesson is part of a larger sermon called the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in Matthew chapter 5 with the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and so forth. And it continues till the end of chapter 7. In summary, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. He's talking about what it would look like if we actually lived out our faith. If we actually took the gospel, the essential message of Jesus, and we lift it out, how would that look like? That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. 
And this morning, we're looking at the section that's subtitled Treasures in Heaven. It begins by saying not to store up treasures on earth where it can be destroyed, but to store up treasures in heaven. Then it goes to verse 22 and uh, 23, if you still have your Bibles open, and it talks about the eye being a lamp of your body. And then in verse 24, Jesus continues to talk about money. Verses 22, uh, 22 and 23 almost feel like it's out of place. It says the eye is a lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy or sound, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your body will be full of darkness. What does this mean? With this little illustration, Jesus is giving us a warning. There is light in this room. And if your eyes are healthy, by the light in here, you'll be able to move about in the sanctuary. You'll be able to see the aisles and you'll be able to see the pews and not stumble and fall. But if your eyes aren't working, even though there's light all around, your whole body, in a a sense, is still in darkness. People who are completely blind can suffer from something called... a circadian disorder. Anybody heard of that? I've seen commercials on television, you know? Okay. Um, Anyways, it's called circadian disorder. It's a disorder when your sleep pattern changes. You sleep during the day, you're very tired during the day, and then you're alert and awake during the night. Because of their blindness, even though it's daylight, their body doesn't realize it. So their days and nights are reversed. In a way, this is what Jesus is illustrating. If your eyes are not healthy... There is nothing else that's going to be able to take the light into your whole body. And your whole body will be, in a sense, in darkness, whether or not this room is filled with light or not. Jesus is saying greed and materialism, possessiveness and ungratefulness are matters of the heart. And unless your hearts are pure, you will have trouble acknowledging and even recognizing it in yourself. Hardly anybody would ever admit that they are greedy or possessive or materialistic. I'm sure you can name a person or two, I can, who you know who are materialistic and greedy, but it's very unlikely that you yourself will think you are. I love this story about a shopper at a mall. One afternoon, after a long morning of shopping, she felt she needed a coffee break. So she bought herself a little bag of cookie and put it in her shopping bag. Then she went to line up for a cup of coffee, got her coffee, looked around the crowded room and found a crowded table and took her seat at the empty chair. She sat down, took the lid off her uh, her coffee, grabbed her magazine, and she began to sip her coffee and read. Across the table from her was a man who was reading a newspaper. After a few minutes, she reached out and took a cookie, and as she did, the man sitting across the table reached out and took one too. This kind of put her off, but she didn't say anything. A few moments later, she took another cookie. Once again, the man did the same. Now, she was getting a little bit upset, but she still didn't say anything. After having a couple more sips of her coffee, she again took another cookie, and so did the man. Now she was really upset, especially since there was only one cookie left. Apparently the man also realized there was only one cookie left. But before she could say anything, the man took the one cookie, broke it in half, gave one to her, and ate the other half. Then he smiled at her, put the newspaper under his arm, and walked off. The lady was steaming by now. Her coffee break was ruined, and thinking ahead at how she would tell her family what would happen to her, she folded her magazine, opened her shopping bag, and there she discovered her own unopened bag of cookies. (laughs) Jesus says, we don't consider the possibility that we're greedy and ungrateful. We always think there are other There are others who are greedy and materialistic, but not me. In fact, here is a litmus test for which you can do. If you're sitting here this morning and saying, greedy, mm, that's not one of the sins that I struggle with. You've failed the test. 
Jesus is telling us that with this little illustration of healthy and unhealthy eyes, that one of the signs or symptoms of being greedy is to say, I'm sure I'm not greedy. To you and to me, Jesus is saying, watch out, because this sin blinds you, and you cannot see it or recognize it. Think about it. When you say your prayers, prayers of confession, do you ever remember asking forgiveness for greed? I'm sure I've confessed my sins of pride, of anger, of lust, even unforgiveness, but I don't think I remember ever confessing the sin of greed. I don't think anyone has prayed, God, forgive me, I am greedy and materialistic. So then what can we do? If this is indeed a heart issue, then we need to cultivate a new heart. Jesus says in verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sometimes people get that backwards. They say where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. In other words, you will spend your money on the things you love. That is probably true, but it isn't what Jesus is saying. He says where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, once you invest your money in something, you will learn to love it. Money takes the lead. It creates the affection. And this is why stewardship is a discipline. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Our hearts will follow where we put our treasure. It's like our wallets are hot wired to our hearts. There is a direct line from our bank accounts to our hearts. If we give money to the church, we will love the church. If we give money to God, we will love God. Our giving to God is more effective in building devotion to him than receiving from God. Think about this. Let's say God blessed you with an extra $20,000 this week. A rich aunt, let's say, died and left you an inheritance. What effect would that have on your spiritual life? Would, you, would it cause you to love God more? Maybe, but probably not. The reality is most of us would take the extra 20000 this week, this week and say, Thank you, Lord, and wonder where can I spend this $20,000. Now imagine the reverse. Imagine that you gave $20,000 to the church, to God. Let's say you put 20000 in an offering plate next week. It's very likely that you will have great interest in the affairs of the church and her ministries. You would think, how could we best minister more effectively? You'd look for ways to help. In a sense, God would have your undivided attention. Our love for God depends more on what we give him than what we receive from him. It seems backwards, but that is the truth. So where is your heart? To answer that, look at where you spend your, the most money on. Of course, most of us have mortgages and so forth, but look where you're spending your discretionary funds on. On who? On what? That will tell you where your heart is. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if this is a heart issue, then we need a new heart, a changed heart. And the only one who's in the business of transforming hearts is the one who gave up all his treasures for us. Jesus, who had the ultimate treasure, he was the Lord of Lords. He was the Son of God. He had the ultimate wealth, the ultimate security, the ultimate status. But he left it all, and he came to earth and was born in a manger, in a feeding trough. He was stripped of everything for us. Philippians chapter 2 says, He who, being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, death on a cross. Why? Why did he do that? Jesus died for something. He died for his treasures. Do you know what his treasures are? You and me. We are his treasures. Jesus looked at us and said, If I have then, even going to hell will be worth it. In Isaiah 53, the prophet said that when the Messiah saw the result of his suffering, he was satisfied. In 2 Peter 2, it says, You are a chosen race. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. 
You are God's purchased possession. That means you are his treasures. When we grasp that truth, when that truth becomes our M.O., then we will be free of worries, free from greed, free from possessiveness. Jesus is the only treasure that will fill your hearts so that you can be free to live big lives, rich lives, lives that are filled with goodness and love and patience and gentleness and long-suffering, lives that make a difference in a world that's fueled by greed and materialism. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. I quote it often, but he wrote, If we consider the unblushing promises of rewards and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. Friends, this stewardship month, think about your offering because your heart will go where your money goes. Money is a spiritual matter. It's important to our spiritual health. Nothing tells us more clearly what we believe than what our credit cards and our checkbooks show us. And nothing establishes our spiritual devotions more quickly, more firmly than what we give to God. Now, having said all that, I need to close by acknowledging that many in our church, I know, have limited incomes. And some are struggling to make ends meet. If you feel bad because you cannot give large amounts to God, you are feeling bad for the wrong reasons. God expects us to give, to give in proportion to what we have received from him. Remember that Jesus said the world's largest offering was what? A penny given by a widow. The largest offering ever offered was a penny because it was everything she had. So if your means are modest, don't feel badly about your giving. You feeling badly is your pride and not God's will. God expects us only to give as we have received. But then, friends, don't discount the importance of your gifts either. Don't think that your little offering doesn't count. Because the reality is, the reality is that the most, most churches' work gets done, gets funded, by people of modest means. And lastly, friends, stewardship isn't just about money. It's also about your time and your talents, your expertise, your availability. It's all of that put together, offered up to God, that we become the body of Christ, God's love on earth for the needy, to the lonely, to the mourning, to the searching. Put your treasures on God, and there your heart will be. Let's pray. Loving Father, the giver of all good gifts, we acknowledge that all we have comes from you. Thank you for your many blessings, for we are truly blessed. And thank you, Lord, for the generous people here at St. Andrews. There are many who give sacrificially their money, their talents, their time, Help us all to work on our discipline of giving. Forgive us for being greedy and materialistic. As we enter the high season of consumerism and gift buying, help us to be cognizant of the one who gave up everything so that we may have another way of life that is different from this world. Lord, help us to truly offer our very selves as living sacrifices for you and your kingdom. We pray this in the name of the one who was sacrificed, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I share with you a benediction I recently heard at a conference I attended. Friends, you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you are, God is sending you there. 
Wherever you are, God has put you there. He has a purpose for you being there. Christ, who indwells you, has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in his peace and love and power. Amen.